so we can't take out well. Lord, you have spoken so much to us uh, over these past several months as we've uh, worked our way through the book of Exodus. And we, we know, Lord, that as we spend time in this text again today, that you are among us by your Spirit, and in your Word you speak to us. Lord, that's a, a precious privilege that we want to not take for granted. Lord, we pray that you would not only speak to our minds this morning, uh, but to our hearts, that you would move us, that we would love you more, and that we would live for you wholeheartedly. We pray that you would do that in Jesus' name. <coughs> well, we've only lived in the kind of northern suburbs of Brisbane for a little over six years now. Uh, if you're not, uh, if you haven't lived here locally for long, I might lose you with this. But if you've lived in this part of town any length of time, uh, you will know the enigma that is South Pine Road. It seems like, a, yeah, there we go, you locals. As you drive around this part of the city, every couple of minutes, you're on South Pine Road again, aren't you? It doesn't seem to matter how many turns you've taken, how many sets of lights you've been through, roundabouts, whatever, you're still on South Pine Road all of a sudden. And, and you can go to Brendale, and you've been up Old Northern Road, which transforms into Old North Road, and they're not the same thing, I've discovered. And then all of a sudden you're on South Pine Road again. <laughs> and it's kind of everywhere. And that's because the way our city evolved, clearly there was some goat track or horse and cart thing that was the only road to anywhere a hundred years ago. And that was South Pine Road. That got you to the South Pine River and across it eventually. And then there are other kinds of cities, right? I don't know how familiar you are with Canberra. But <laughs> Canberra, Canberra has this thing called the Parliamentary Triangle. I didn't know it had a name until I did some Googling this weekend. Or the National Triangle. This is the, the ceremonial precinct of Canberra. It's formed by three significant roads. Commonwealth Avenue, Kings Avenue and Constitution Avenue, which kind of excites you. It's an exciting place to live, doesn't it? Sorry to the new fields. <laughs> Parliament House, of course, is at one of the points of that triangle, and so you end up with those uh, famous views down those avenues. You can look all the way from Parliament House uh, to the War Memorial and, and things like that. That's down the guts of the triangle, I think. Um, down Anzac Parade, uh, from City Hill, you can look all the way down Commonwealth Avenue and see Parliament House, and so there's these big wide avenues lined with trees and all this and of course uh, and then you've got that man-made lake Lake Burley Griffin in the middle which is so big I think it's 40 k's around it you might think it's it's natural uh, it was dug out there was just a small river there and and all the major buildings are supposed to have frontage to the lake and they're all in the triangle and and angles and perspectives and how things look uh, because that was a planned city right it wasn't one and, and Sydney and Melbourne couldn't agree who would be the boss and so we said let's let's pick that nothing there in between and we'll make that our capital. One of these, South Pine Road where we live, gradually evolved over time. The other was intentionally planned with the end in mind. And as much as it hurts me to say this, the book of Exodus is Canberra, not South Pine Road. <laughs> But we can read the book of Exodus as all those kind of interesting stories that we know in isolation. And they lay a foundation of much of the Old Testament. They point to Jesus and, and help enrich our understanding of the gospel. But we've deliberately looked at this book consecutively over 18 Sundays, the last five months, in order that we might see not only those individual stories, but, but how it all kind of hangs together as a whole. <clears throat> and in so doing, to discover the writer's purpose in preserving the book of Exodus for the generations to come. Uh, as we've said before, it divides uh, into two main halves. The first 18 chapters are all about redemption, the redemption of Israel. They're in slavery. Moses is called. There's those great salvation moments with the Passover and the Exodus itself and crossing the Red Sea and they make their way to Mount Sinai. And then chapters 19 to 40 
uh, are all about revelation. It's all our words, right? Redemption, revelation. This is about God, about Yahweh making himself known to Israel uh, in, in covenant. And so he gives the law, they get the instructions about the tabernacle, then they rebel and make a golden calf. He reissues the law, they finally build the tabernacle, and then uh, the glory of God comes and descends on the tabernacle. And so it's redemption, it's revelation, and the end point is, is relationship. God has a clear purpose in saving his people. It's to show his glory by fulfilling the promises that he made in, in his covenant to Abraham 400 years earlier. And it's that the people might know him and worship him and that he might dwell among them as their God. This is the climactic ending of the whole narrative that God's going to come and be among the people. God's purpose in liberating Israel was always to bring Israel to himself at Sinai and then for him to come to them. And as we arrive at this final chapter, it's finally happening. We're getting to that climactic end point. Uh, the first 16 verses of this final chapter, uh, which we're going to have read to us, uh, record God's instructions to Moses about the assembly of the tabernacle. Uh, if you were here last week, you'll know We've had all the, the building of the bits for the tabernacle. The description of what to do was given chapters earlier. And finally, here's Moses uh, putting it all together. Now, the first two verses of chapter 40 say, Then the Lord said to Moses, Set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, on the first day uh, of the first month. Uh, the command to, to put this together, notice, is to happen on the first day of the first month. Verse 17, if you look down, uh, reiterates this and adds it's the first day of the first month in the second year. This is just under a year since the Israelites were set free from slavery in Egypt. That's when they were to begin their calendar. It's the, the first anniversary of the Passover is about to be celebrated. Now it may be that parts of the tabernacle were, were ready ahead of this date, but the assembly is to coincide with this moment. Uh, with this significant day is to be the celebration of a new year, a new start for God's people, a new opening to worship God. Uh, in the first uh, eight verses or so, it, it's all about setting this up. The description here of what Moses is doing and assembling the tabernacle is pretty brief, kind of finally, we've had lots of details. Of course, the relevant details have all come earlier. Uh, but the sense we get is that there's a place for everything and everything's in its place. Uh, notice, scan through those um, first eight verses. Notice all the verbs that are in there. I feel like I'm back at high school or primary school doing an assignment where you've got to circle the verbs and underline the nouns or something like that, which is what happened in my preparation this week. But the verbs give us a, a clear kind of pattern in the assembly of the tabernacle. Now, verses one to eight, you're constantly reading place this, put this, uh, set this up, set out, etc. Um, and then verses 9 to 11 is about consecrating the, the stuff, the parts of the tabernacle. And verses 12 to 16, they're consecrating or anointing the priests themselves. Uh, so verses 1 to 8 is, is setting it up, um, placing everything, putting everything in its place. Uh, and then verses 9 to 11, it's all about anointing and consecrating the furnishings. Uh, verse 9 says, take the anointing oil uh, and anoint the tabernacle and everything in it. Consecrate it and all its furnishings and it will be holy. Uh, this anointing, this putting oil on even the stuff that's making up the tabernacle was for the purpose of consecration. Uh, clearly it symbolised uh, cleanness and purity, but most especially that they were set apart for a sacred purpose. This tent and all its furnishings were going to be in very close proximity to the presence of Yahweh in, in the most holy place. And so the act of consecration was recognition of just how special and holy this place was to be. Before this, up to this point, only one place has been described as holy and that was Mount Sinai that was the holy mountain because God had come and been there and and now the holy place is going to be right 
in the midst of the people. Not, not up a mountain where they can stay at a distance, it's going to be right there in the middle of this tent. And the priests also in verses 12 to 16, verse 12 uh, says, Bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them uh, with water. Uh, then dress Aaron in, sac in the sacred garments, anoint him and consecrate him so he may serve me as priest. And so just like the furniture that the people, the priests need consecrating as well. They're the special people set apart for the sacred purpose and so their anointing has the same kind of symbolism. And then verse 16 rounds it off. Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded him. Now, we mentioned this last week, but this is a clear contrast to the golden calf episode, where everybody did exactly what the Lord had not asked them to do, the opposite of that. Here, Moses, on behalf of the people, is doing exactly as God says. They have repented, and now they're doing things God's way. And so, uh, from verse 17, Moses starts doing what the Lord has instructed. Uh, it's all the Lord said, the Lord said up to this point, and now it was done. Have a look there at verses uh, 17 and 18. So the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month in the second year. When Moses set up the tabernacle, he put the bases in place, erected the frames, inserted the crossbars and set up the posts. And so he's, he's doing all the stuff that he's been asked to do. Uh, there's a progress broadly from the inside to the outside, the kind of tabernacle, the most holy place with the ark, the holy place with the table and the lampstand, and then eventually the, the courtyard uh, around outside of that. Poor old Moses, it seems, is living some kind of Ikea nightmare, isn't he? I kind of hope he's got his number five Allen key. You know, it's always in that box somewhere. Uh, all the bits are laid out. Um, the, the, everyone's contributed to make this stuff. The expert artisans have put it all together. And, and Moses has got his Allen key and he's got, to, he's got to put it all together in front of everyone. There's a couple of million people watching this heartache as he tries to uh, put this thing together. But imagine the anticipation as this is finally being assembled. They've, they've heard about this, they've all contributed towards it, and finally here it is coming together. I want to reread the, the whole section um, through to verse 33, 17 to 33. As I do, I want you to take notice of the kind of the rhythm, the repetition, uh, the pattern of behaviour. <coughs> and see if it reminds you of anything uh, of another passage by the way that it's written. Uh, if you've got a Bible or a device there that you can follow along, that would be terrific. Uh, so the tabernacle uh, was set up on the first day of the first month in the second year. When Moses set up the tabernacle, he put the bases in place, erected the frames, inserted the crossbars and set up the posts. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering over the tent as the Lord commanded him. Here's where we really start looking for the rhythm and repetition. He took the tablets of the covenant law and placed them in the ark, attached the poles to the ark, and put the atonement cover over it. Then he brought the ark into the tabernacle and hung the shielding curtain shielded, uh, the, and shielded the ark of the covenant law as the Lord commanded him. <clears throat> Moses placed the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the curtain and set out the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord commanded him. He placed the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and he set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded him. Moses placed the gold altar in the tent of meeting in front of the curtain and burned fragrant incense on it as the Lord commanded him. Then he put the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering near the entrance to the tabernacle the tent of meeting and offered it, offered on it burnt offerings and grain offerings as the Lord commanded him. He placed the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing. And Moses and Aaron and his sons used it to wash their hands and feet. They washed whenever they entered the tent of meeting or approached the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses 
finished the work. I wonder if you picked up that kind of rhythm and repetition there. We're back in Eden. That's the image we're supposed to get here, is we're kind of, we're rereading the creation narrative. <clears throat> it's written very deliberately with a similar feel and rhythm to Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, if you remember, there's a distinct pattern to how God creates. It's not just random. It's not written like a, a Westerner would write a, a kind of science text. It's written poetically so that we see God forms, God separates, and God fills. You know, God, God makes the waters, and then he separates the waters above from the waters below, the sky and the ocean. And then he fills one with bird life and one with sea life, right? Over and over again. And what happens at the end of each day? And there was evening, and there was morning, the, the sixth day, the whatever day. Here, as Moses is kind of doing this recreation thing, Moses sets up, he forms, as we read before, the ark, the table, the lampstand, the gold altar, uh, the altar of burnt offering, the wash basin. He separates. He keeps hanging curtains, did you notice? Separating the elements and the furniture, consecrating them. He separates the priest by consecrating them. The curtains separate this area from that area. And he fills in each space he puts the things that need to go there and, and here we see them begin to get used there's incense burned on the altar of incense the wash basin outside the tabernacle in the courtyard is being used and in genesis 1 each creation day finishes with and he saw that it was good here in genesis 40 notice the refrain at the end of each paragraph every couple of verses as the Lord commanded him, or as the Lord commanded Moses. It's there seven times. <clears throat> These words are a similar kind of declaration of the goodness of the work of assembling the tabernacle. At the end of, of the creation of the world, at the end of creation week, God finishes his work, declares it very good, and rests. And at the end of the tabernacle assembly, we read at the end of verse 33, and so Moses finished the work. Just as God finished the work of creation, so now the work of recreation through Moses was complete. Everything had been done right. Everything was ready. That There's this brand new moment in salvation history happening now. We're used to thinking it's, it's the exodus from Egypt and, it, and it, like it's all part of this. But at this point in the final chapter, very clearly the symbolism of is there's a new start. Something new is happening. One thing remained. The one thing was for God to come and dwell among his people. In Eden, of course, he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, didn't he? And so now, having created a mini Eden uh, with the tabernacle, the one thing that remains is for God to come, for the glory of God to enter and to dwell there. And so we pick up at verse 34. <clears throat> then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Immediately as Moses finishes the work of assembling the tabernacle and all its elements, the cloud comes down and, and covers the tent of meeting. This gives this kind of divine seal of approval to the work that Moses has done on behalf of the people. The presence of the cloud was the end point of the successful, obedient completion of this project. It's ready now for the presence of the Lord to inhabit it. But it indicates even so much more than that. The cloud is the way God chose to manifest himself so, so that the people can see that God has come. It's always associated with God's glory. It displays his, his presence and his glory in the way that they could see. Remember, the cloud first appeared to guide and protect the Israelites as they were escaping Egypt and getting away from the Egyptian army through the Red Sea, protecting them from behind and guiding them forward. It led them through the wilderness toward Mount Sinai and it rested on Mount Sinai as the law was given. 
it had appeared over the tent of meeting which Moses had erected uh, and he would go there and he would go into the tent and the cloud would come just outside the tent uh, now that's been reversed then it had come down when the glory of God passed by Moses in chapter 34 and now it comes and it rests over the tabernacle that this moment kind of so long anticipated for the Israelites and now finally completed that the cloud rests it, it settles upon the tabernacle it's not moving anymore it's here and symbolized by the cloud God's glory filled the tabernacle God's glory that that's the weightiness of his divine <coughs> being the infinite perfection of, of his deity the glory is kind of the, the whole godness of God is what that's all trying to grasp at the glory of the Lord has come and filled a tent which they had made for God. That's astonishing, isn't it? It's unimaginable. It's outrageous and kind of scandalous. The glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle was the clearest indication God could give that God is fully in covenant relationship with the Israelites. He'd entered his house, his, his tent to dwell among them. His glory has settled and, and, it, and it's filled there and he's made sure that they could see it. This is exactly what the Israelites have been anticipating uh, since the end of the instructions about building the tabernacle and, and all of that. It's the culmination of everything God has been working towards in the whole book of Exodus since rescuing his people. I'm going to rescue you so that we can go to Mount Sinai and you can worship me there and we can meet together. We can do this relationship thing. This doesn't feel that much like a climax to us, does it? I think it's the crossing of the Red Sea that, that feels like the climax to us. Often that's where it ends when we teach this stuff at Sunday school. You'd be happy to know our Kids and Kids Club have been working through Exodus and some of the subsequent stories this term. My kids now know about the tabernacle. Uh, can I encourage you over morning tea, find a kid that looks like they're in primary school uh, and ask them what they've been learning, what they've been discovering. It doesn't feel like that much of a climax to us that the tent's gone up and the clouds come down. But for the Israelites, this is momentous. For God, this is the destination his saving work has always been heading towards. And Israel is going to follow him wherever he goes. I get that picture of... Uh, donkey and shrek in the shrek movies i don't know if that's familiar to everyone but that kind of annoying donkey is like shrek wherever you go man i'm coming and that's kind of it's, it's warm and loving and it's oh my goodness he's coming with me everywhere that that's the kind of sense in these last couple of verses that finishes with a picture of the future in all the travels of the israelites whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle they would set out but if the cloud did not lift they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. Israel would follow God by following this cloud that represented his glory. There's this brand new chapter in the, Israel, in the history of Israel that's about to begin. There are mobile people, they're living in tents, God's living in tents. But God is among them always with this cloud that they can see by fire and night. The great reassurance here for the Israelites is that God will always be with them. That they've known God to be the sovereign creator who's up there and he's come down among them and they can even see it. And they can know now that that God, their God, the true God is always going to be with them. And the tabernacle's not stuck in one place, it's portable. And so God is going to lead his people to the promised land. That, that's where this is all heading, right? Leviticus is next, and then Numbers as they begin the Deut journey. Deuteronomy, where Moses gives his final <coughs> speech. And then Joshua takes over, and in they go. That's where the trajectory is headed. God is going to lead his people towards the promised land. And his promise was to be with them all the way along the way. As long as they followed him, he would be right there among them, in their midst the whole time. 
if we put ourselves in the shoes of those in the coming generations who are actually a given exodus to read, the generation who's there is living this, but we, we've got to ask always, why was the book written? Why did God inspire an author to write this? Well, it's usually for the next generation. The generation that's entering the promised land to remind them that God is with them and that God's promised to go with them and lead them. And so they must keep following him. See, God's whole agenda in Exodus has been this recreation moment. It's been to start over, to start again. The book of Exodus in the Old Testament narrative is a fresh start. It's a reset for God's promises to God's and for God's people. So the Bible, of course, is full of restarts, isn't it? There's the actual start and creation which we've refre- reflected on with Adam and then they fail monumentally with the fall and Adam and Eve sin. And then uh, there's a, there's a, and things go from bad to worse and there's a restart, right, with the flood, with Noah. Let's start again. Let's, let's flood this thing and go again. And then they sin again and they fail and the Tower of Babel is the kind of major failure point. And so then Abraham is called. And this is the promise to Abraham. Is kind of, there's going to be a restart. I'm going to begin it with your family. Uh, but, but there's going to be lots of you. And you're going to enter the promised land. And that's what we're working out here through the book of Exodus. With Moses and Israel. And so there's redemption. And there's revelation. And there's relationship. And we, we see this, um, this phase of it coming to completion here at the book of Exodus. Finally, that restart that was promised with Abraham is kind of happening here materially. But we know we're going to see them fail also, aren't we? Leviticus is a book full of instructions and then Numbers just begins their failure. They're they're grumbling, they're complaining, they're in lack of trust in God. And read the rest of the Old Testament. They're going to fail again and again and again. They are constantly going to break the laws and commands that they are given here in Exodus. And so what Israel really needed what the whole of creation really needed, and I hope this doesn't provoke people too much, was a great reset. That's what it needed. This is what begins with the coming of Jesus. Redemption by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Revelation in the incarnate Son of God, not just a list of laws. And relationship with the Father through the Son by the Spirit. Jesus is the glory in the tabernacle. His glory, God's glory, came down in Jesus. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Hebrews 1, verse 3, the Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. That glorious moment where the glory of God descended on the tabernacle is repeated in Jesus' coming. The glory of God descending and then by his spirit in, in us. And so in Jesus, just as God finished his work at creation. Moses finished the work of setting up the tent. In Jesus, the work is finished. Everything is set up for another reset, for God to do relationship with us. The way has been made for relationship with God by Jesus coming. And and there's an even greater reset coming still when Jesus returns once more and inaugurates the new creation. Revelation gives us a picture of the new heavens and the new earth and of God's glory filling his heavenly temple. In Revelation 15 verse 8, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. Sound familiar? It's all going to happen again, this, uh, this final reset. See, God didn't just save Israel to leave them in the wilderness. And God didn't just save us and then move on. To all who trust in him, Jesus gives the promise of his everlasting presence. Matthew 28, verse 20, at the end of the Great Commission, and surely I am with you always, 
to the very end of the age. God reveals himself to us in Christ. God redeems us through Christ. And God wants continued relationship with us. That's the end game. It's not done just at our redemption, at our, at our salvation. God saved them and saved us because he wants relationship.